Some things you could be sure of in life, guarantees. And one of them is every month a new handheld straight from China will release. So it comes as no surprise that Ambernick has released yet another retro emulation handheld. This is the RG353V. Not to be confused with every other handheld out there that's come out of China and from Ambernick. It's pretty easy to get these things confused with how many have released and continue to release and how many companies make them. But yeah, I got to be honest here. This one, I do like some of the stuff that they've done with it. There is another version of this one, though, that also recently released from Ambernick, which is the RG353VS. There's an S on the end of it. That one has less RAM and features and is also cheaper. So if you're interested in what I'm looking at today in this video, make sure you're, you're taking a look at the proper one. The company that sent this to me is linked in the pinned comments down below. Uh, it's always going to be a secondary seller. Usually Ambernick, they don't send me anything anymore. Uh, they haven't for the longest time, maybe because I've been pretty critical. I don't know. But yeah, the, the shop that sent it to me is linked down below. So the RG353V is using the RK3566 quad-core 64-bit CPU. It has two gigabytes of RAM, two micro SD card slots, one for your secondary OS and one for games and other files. It comes as a dual boot system with Android 11 and Linux. Now on the Android side of things, it actually came with some cool stuff in my opinion, but we'll get to that later. So it also has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 4.2, 3200 milliamp hour battery for around six hours of life, and is equipped with a 3.5 inch IPS touchscreen, which is a 640 by 480 resolution uh, screen. It also has HDMI output, which is cool. And I've tested it, works great. Some of the footage here today, you'll see that. Uh, you could plug this thing into your TV or monitor, either use the built-in controls or sync up a different controller. So you got options. Now, as far as the, uh, the build quality is concerned, I was initially a, a little worried when I saw the shoulder buttons in this orientation. I think I've messed with another handheld that was fairly similar. It, it's all a blur, really, with how many of these things have come out. But with this one, I adapted to them you know pretty quick and they actually felt fine it's a it's a weird setup but i mean how many other ways could they have uh you know put these decently sized shoulder buttons on an orientation or setup like this after me using them for a while i can't really complain too much they work fine now the face buttons and d-pad they feel decent better than a lot of other handhelds i've used they get the job done not the greatest not the worst a little above average a little more above average than most of the ones I've said are a little above average. You know, I'm able to use the D-pad for them Hadoukis and Dragon Punches with fairly decent accuracy. Not much to complain about there. Now also the screen, as I mentioned, it looks great and the touch controls work perfectly fine when using Android. So the setup that I received, it came with a 128 gigabyte retro game build uh, on a micro SD card with over 20,000 games. They have a bunch of different options, different prices, that kind of thing. Uh, but you can also set this thing up with ArcOS or make your own build. But as I know, plenty of people are looking for simple, ready-to-go setups. I'm just reviewing this based on how it was sent to me. Now, as far as the build for the games go, this is your typical ROM dump, which always annoys me. And it's always like a, a big factor for me when I kind of, you know, review these things. Now, when you see... Super Nintendo, NES, and Genesis with thousands and thousands of ROMs, more than any region had released, you know it's going to be a sloppy build. And here, that's exactly what it is. Not much in the way of uh, metadata and images scraped for the games. Some things will have images, but most do not. So, you know, you got to read everything. You don't get that visual stimulation. Now, you got duplicates, multiple regions, ROM hacks all mixed up in each system's list. And that's going to be for all your standard consoles, NES, Super Nintendo, Genesis, and some of the handhelds as well, Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Now, you got to understand, I'm not complaining that there are other regions beside USA version games. That's not what my point is when I, you know, point these things out. These things are sold out of China to people all over the world. So having different regions makes sense. My complaint is that it's all mixed together and difficult to browse through. There's just so many games listed for each of these systems all mixed together. 
Not having box art or screenshots or even proper game names for a lot of things is really amateurish to me. It's not difficult, but when you make a build like this, why not set up multiple folders or region lists for each system? Have hacks in their own category, not just a clusterfuck of everything together. It would just make things a lot nicer to look at and easier to navigate through. But they don't do that. Like, what the fuck is Flying Bat Boy for the Mega Drive? There's so many examples like this. Weird names with no image, so you don't know what the hell you're getting into. Now, okay, as I've said, this setup is sloppy as hell, but I also found tons of things I've never seen before. <laughs> Weird Chinese ROM hacks, like, or like, you know, homebrews, I don't know, like Street Fighter 60? They just like recently announced Street Fighter 6. How did we skip through 7 through 59? But shit, I, I did play this game for a minute and for an NES game, it's not bad. It actually played fairly well. I guess they call it Street Fighter 60 because it has 60, you know, fighters to select from. So, I mean, maybe with all this weirdness of a setup, of a ROM dump, it might be enticing to some people. I mean, there's just a lot of weird stuff going on here. It's interesting to say the least. But to performance, that's really what matters. In like 99% of previous handhelds I've reviewed, it's gonna be the same thing. All your eight and 16 bit, you know, stuff will work great, including PlayStation 1. I mean, you guys should know by now, PS1 can run on your mom's vibe at like 300 FPS, so here it's good as well. But things like Nintendo 64 and Dreamcast are usually a mixed bag. And performance here, it's a little interesting. I think maybe emulator settings or the actual emulators that they chose to use here um, have been kind of changed up over stock builds I've looked at before. But Nintendo 64, I wound up having better performance on some games over previous handhelds with the same chipset that I've used from these Chinese companies. So that was kind of cool, but no guarantee that everything will run perfectly. You're bound to find something that either doesn't load at all, chugs along, or has graphics glitches. No one could test all 20,000 games on a setup like this, so go into it with your expectations and check. Dreamcast, they only included a small handful of games, and this time around, performance was fairly typical. Some slowdowns, some glitches, but just like not much to really test here and nothing to write home about. It's a mixed bag, dude. For me, I don't like to emulate Dreamcast or Nintendo 64 on a device if it's not flawless. So I don't look at these types of handhelds as something I will play those systems on, but they always include these systems and ROMs and sure, you may find some stuff that runs okay, but don't be disappointed when you try your favorite game and it runs like shit. It's just bound to happen. And they also did include PSP with just a handful of games. And if you're not familiar with the games on here, you might think they're running perfectly fine, but they are running a tad bit slow. Maybe that's acceptable to you, not for me, but hey, that's the way it is. You can always tinker with the emulator settings for PSP and you might find a combination that improves performance for this stuff, but don't expect miracles. Not everything will run even if you can get a few things to run okay. So before we wrap this up, I wanted to quickly talk about the Android side of things. So they added a couple features I think are awesome. This Android setup is very responsive and runs well it appears and definitely will allow for you to do a lot of things with it. Maybe it'll even be easier for some people to play things that they want on this handheld or get things set up to tinker with but I think most users will be fine staying on the Linux side of things, just playing their games. But here to make things a bit more accessible and user-friendly, Ambernic added two extra buttons in the operating system. One is the Ambernic logo icon. And once you click it, it'll take you to an emulation setup with all your ROMs being accessible. I like that. You don't have to go looking for emulators or fiddle fucking with RetroArch. Just click the icon and go. The other thing I thought was cool is that they have another icon that looks like the Switch logo. No, this does not let you play Switch games. But if it shows that logo, your button layout will mimic the standard Nintendo layout. Tap that icon, it switches to the Xbox logo. Now your button layout automatically changes to the Xbox standard layout. I think that's useful. These are definitely nice additions to the OS. So my final thoughts. It's a messy ROM dump of a build with your typical performance nothing miraculous going on here. I think the screen and build are nice in my opinion. If 
if I were to give this a score, I'd probably say a 7.5 out of 10. I kind of like it, but I also have other options I'd rather use. But those options for me are larger, more expensive options. Everybody's going to be different. So maybe this one tickles it for you with its size, features, and price. Now, the company that sent it to me includes that extra micro SD card with games on it, and they do typically charge more for that than if it came with nothing. I've typically seen these selling for slightly over $100 without the game SD card. But my point really is, just keep your expectations in check when it comes to performance. And if you do buy one of these, don't get mad when a new revision comes out a couple weeks later that winds up having features you would have rather had. Because it's bound to happen. Thanks for watching. Bye.